Chapter 49 is going to focus on the nervous system. Um, the human brain has around 100 billion neurons that are arranged into the circuits we talked about previously that are more complex than the most um, powerful supercomputers super are. Um, and so the picture that you saw on the first slide, um, it's looking at brain exploration and how you could com um, combine colored proteins to kind of see how things are working in concert. Um, and that might help um, researchers be able to have a better understanding of how information is transferred throughout the brain. So animals are able to respond to external stimuli and maintain homeostasis as a result of their nervous systems. Um, even the simplest animals, the so nadarians that have nervous systems, have neurons arranged in nerve nets, which are basically just nerve cells connected to one another. Um, animals being multicellular um, respond to stimuli using neuron systems. Um, more complex animals have nerves, which are bundles of axons of multiple nerve cells. Um, and then another example would be a sea star, which has nerve nets in each arm that are connected via nerves to a central nerve ring. Um, back when we talked about diversity with animals, we talked about how um, bilaterally symmetrical animals exhibit cephalization, which is when their sensory organs are clustered together at the front end of their body. Um, simple cephalized animals like flatworms will have a CNS. It's just a brain and nerve cords that are longitudinal. Then we have annelids and arthropods that have segmentally arranged clusters of neurons called ganglia. Um, and the system that animals are using for their nervous system tends to um, have a connection to their lifestyle. If you are sessile, you're not moving like clams and chitons, you'll tend to have more simple systems. Well, if you're more complex, complex like octopi or squids, your systems will be a little more sophisticated. In vertebrates, um, the central nervous system is your brain and your spinal cord. Your peripheral nervous system is your contains your nerves and your ganglia. So those are just examples of some of the ones we talked about. Um, how the vertebrate nervous system is organized. The spinal cord is inside of your vertebrate column. It's able to convey information to and from your brain. And it's able to um, conduct reflexes or produce reflexes um, independently of the brain. So that allows reflexes to occur a lot more quickly. Um, reflexes are your body's um, automatic response to a stimulus. Um, is controlled by what we call a reflex arc, a neural pathway that only involves neurons that are able to synapse in the spinal, spinal cord, aka when you get the knee jerk reflex from the doctor. Um, invertebrates have a ventral nerve cord, vertebrates have a dorsal spinal cord. Um, the spinal cord and brain develop from either the embryonic dorsal nerve cord or what we call the neural tube. Your brain is covered with the meninges. There's three protective layers of them, dura, pia, and arachnoid matter. So that's just showing um, how you have your sensory neuron um, that once the um, doctor has decided to test your reflex, it moves into your interneurons um, in your spine. And then the signal, once it's been processed, transpends back out through the motor neuron. So a little bit quicker and simpler than if it has to go all the way up to the brain and back down. Um, vertebrate nervous systems. Um, the neural tube um, is gonna give rise to the central canal and your brain ventricles. Um, that canal along with the ventricles are hollow and they are filled with um, cerebrospinal fluid, which is filtered from the blood helps to cushion the brain and the spinal cord, give it nutrients and hormones and get rid of any waste. Both your brain and your spinal cord have both gray and white matter, but they actually flip. Um, the gray matter is going to be your neuron cell bodies, your dendrites or unmyelinated axons. It's in the outer part of your brain and the inner part of your spinal cord. It is involved with muscular and sensory activity. While the white matter are your myelinated axons, as well as glial cells, I don't know why I said and astrocytes, because astrocytes are glial cells. Again, it flips the inner part of your brain is white matter, and the outer part is a, um, of, of your spinal cord is white matter. Why it's white? It's because of the myelin um, that's present. It's composed of lipids, um, and allows for faster signal transport. We talked about that a little bit in the last chapter. So this is going to impact on your normal sensory and motor functions. 
So there you go, seeing the gray versus the white in the brain and the gray versus the white in the spine. Um, nerves. There are 12 um, pairs of cranial nerves that are from the brain and just um, innervate organs in the head and upper body. These are dealing with your senses. Um, so they're going to relay information between your head and neck and the brain. And then there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that are from your spinal cord and go throughout your whole body. These are going to carry um, signals that are motor, sensory, and autonomic between the body and the spinal cord. And then they're grouped based on regions. You've got cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal pairs. These make up your peripheral nervous system. So again, you can see the nerves in the head that are part of the cranial nerves that are the peripheral nervous system. The brain and the spinal cord are your central nervous system. And then all the nerves coming off of them and the ganglia are part of your peripheral nervous system. Glia. Um, we talked about these a little bit last chapter about how they help to nourish and support and regulate your neurons. Um, the embryonic radial glia help to form tracts that neurons can use to migrate. Um, astrocytes, more specifically, are able to take the cells that are lining the capillaries in your central nervous system and encourage them to make tight junctions, which is how we get the blood-brain barrier. And it helps to prevent um, substances from entering the brain. Um, they're able to communicate with one another and with neurons with chemical signals. Your oligo, oligodendrocytes are similar to your astrocytes, and, but they provide support and insulation in the form of myelin to your axons in the CNS. The Schwann cells do the same thing as oligodendrocytes, but they do it in the PNS. Okay. Peripheral nervous system is getting the information to your central nervous system and taking information from it. It's also able to um, regulate movement, um, so skeletal, and internal environment. So the PNS, the afferent neurons, are taking information to the CNS, while the efferent neurons are transmitting that information away from it. Um, two efferent components make up the PNS, your motor system and your autonomic nervous system. The motor system, as we talked about, is the one that deals with the skeletal muscles. Um, it is a voluntary system. The autonomic nervous system is regulating your smooth and your cardiac muscles. It is generally involuntary. And within the autonomic nervous system, there's three divisions, sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric. The sympathetic is going to get you up and moving, it regulates arousal and energy generation, fight or flight. The parasympathetic is going to act in, um, act antagonistically um, compared to the sympathetic. It's going to promote calming and rest and digest functions. The enteric, enteric division, excuse me, is going to control your digestive tract, your pancreas, and your gallbladder. So that's kind of showing you the breakdown, afferent going into the central nervous system, efferent coming out. Um, the afferent gets its information from sensory receptors, which get their information from the internal or external stimuli. The afferent new neurons are going to go down one of two paths, the motor system where they're going to take care of your skeletal muscles or the autonomic nervous system um, where they're going to take care of your smooth muscles, your cardiac muscles, and your glands through either the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, or the enteric divisions. And so there you're seeing the difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic. So parasympathetic is getting you moving. Sympathetic is calming you down. Vertebrate brain is regionally specialized. There are um, specific structures that will do um, be responsible for diverse functions, and they have developed during your embryonic development. Um, as the human embryo develops, your neural, neural tube will form three bulges that are anterior, your hindbrain, your midbrain, and your forebrain. Your brainstem is made of the midbrain and part of the hindbrain, the pons and the medulla oblongata. Uh, the rest of your hindbrain is going to give you your cerebellum. The forebrain is going to um, develop into the diencephalon. Um, your brain's neuroendocrine tissues are included in that, as well as the teles telencephalon, which is your cerebrum. The cerebrum is growing so much during the second and third months of development that the outer portion that's made of gray matter, the cortex, will help to extend over and around much of the brain. Okay. And we'll talk about each of those regions in the next few slides, but that's just kind of showing you the development, where things are going. 
and how quickly they be formed. The cerebrum is um, going to control your skeletal muscles contracting. It is um, the center of learning, emotion, memory, and perception. Um, there are two cerebral hemispheres, left and right. The cortex is going to be essential for your perception, your voluntary movements, and your learning. The left side of the cortex gets information from and controls movement of your right side. And the right side of your cortex receives information from and controls movement of your left side. Um, the corpus callosum, which is just a thick band of axons, allows the two sides of the cortex to communicate with one another. Basal nuclei, which are neuron clusters deep within the white matter, um, help to serve as centers for planning and learning movement sequences. And cerebral palsy um, will or can result if there is cerebrum damage. The diencephalon is going to give you your thalamus, your hypothalamus, and your epithalamus. The thalamus is the primary input center for sensory information that's going to the cerebrum. Um, that information is sorted in the thalamus and then is sent to whatever cerebral center it needs to go to for additional processing. The um, hypothalamus is going to um, serve as your body's thermostat, as we talked about with the endocrine, endocrine system, is the central biological clock. Um, it's where your hormones, the posterior pituitary, and the ones that are released that act on the anterior pituitary are found. Regulates your hunger, thirst, sexual mating behaviors, fight or fight response. The epithalamus is where the pineal gland, your melatonin, is located, and it contains capillary clusters that help to produce the cerebrospinal fluid from blood. The cerebellum is going to help to coordinate movement and balance. Um, it helps with learning and remembering motor skills. Um, it gets information, sensory information about joint positions and muscle length, and it also gets inputs from your auditory and visual systems. Um, it's able to monitor the motor commands at the cerebrum issues and takes that information to carry out coordination and error checking um, during motor and perceptual functions. Um, Hand-eye function would fall into here. Brainstem, the midbrain receives and gets lots of different sensory information then sends it out to the specific forebrain regions. The sensory axons that are involved in hearing will terminate here or they will pass through here to get to the cerebrum. It's um, going to coordinate visual reflexes. Um, the pons and the medulla helps to take information from the PNS and transfer it between there and the midbrain and forebrain. So it's going to help to coordinate large scale body movements. Um, as we talked about before, the right side controls most of the movement on the left side and vice versa. And the reason why this happens is because axons cross between the two sides. It also helps to control several automatic homeostatic functions, things that we need to live off of. Breathing, heart blood vessel activity, swallowing, vomiting, digestion. The medulla is primarily responsible for this, but the pons does help. Arousal and sleep. Brainstem and cerebrum help to control these. Um, the brainstem core has a diffuse neuron network, which is called the reticular formation. It's able to regulate how much information and what type of information actually gets to the cortex. So when you're waking up, it's not necessarily going to send a whole lot of information at once unless you really need to get going. That fight or flight tick kicks in. Melatonin is released from the pineal gland and plays a role in both bird and mammal sleep cycles. Why we need sleep. Um, it's thought that it plays a role in consolidating learning with memory. How are dolphins then able to sleep? I thought this was pretty cool. One brain hemisphere sleeps at a time, so that way they can swim and still be asleep. Um, biological clock regulation. Sleep and wakefulness are examples of circadian rhythms, daily biological activity cycles. Mammalian circadian rhythms rely on a biological clock that's able to direct periodic gene expression. It's typically synchronized to light and dark cycles. In mammals, um, there's a group of neurons in the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, that coordinates these and it acts as a pacemaker to synchronize your clock, biologically speaking. Emotions. Um, generation experience of emotions involves a lot of different brain structures, including the amygdala, the hippocampus, and parts of the thalamus. Um, these structures are grouped as the limbic system, which also helps with motivation, olfaction, being able to smell things, behavior, and memory. Um, generation and um, 
experience of emotion will require interaction between both your limbic system and your sensory areas within the cerebrum. Um, the structure that's most important to your emotional storage in your memory is the amygdala, um, which is a mass of nuclei which are near your cerebrum space. Okay, so there you can see that. Cerebral cortex is responsible for voluntary movement, cognitive functions. It's the largest structure in your human brain. There's four regions, the frontal, the temporal, occipital, and parietal that are landmarks for specific functions. The frontal lobe is the largest. It's located at the front of each of your hemispheres. It's a side of Broca's area. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, it is responsible for controlling your skeletal muscles and executive functions like decision-making, planning, and judgment. Parietal lobe is in the middle part of your brain. It's responsible for your peripheral sensations and spatial orientation. The temporal lobe is at the bottom of the brain. It's responsible for processing auditory information, the site of Wernicke's area. The occipital lobe is at the bottom back of the brain. It's responsible for processing visual information. So that's just showing you the different areas. Um, so we've been able to study the brain and map out areas that are responsible for both language and speech. Broca's area is um, going to be active in the frontal lobe when you are generating speech. Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe is active when you hear speech. Um, these two areas belong to a larger um, network of regions that are involved in language and are both found in the left hemisphere. Lateralization helps to... Um, connect the brain together. Um, the two hemispheres make distinct contributions to brain function. The left hemisphere is more um, prepared to handle language, math, logic, and processing. The right hemisphere is stronger at pattern recognition, nonverbal thinking, emotional processing. And so the differences between them is lateralization. The why they're able to work in concept is through that corpus callosum, the axons that help to make up those fibers, and lateralization is partly linked to handedness, whether you are a lefty or a righty. Cerebral cortex gets information from sensory organs and from somatosensor receptors, which are found in your skin, your joints, your ligaments, your muscles, and fascia, which help to provide it with information about various characteristics, and it's able to direct input types to different locations as a result. Those um, adjacent areas are able to process specific features and then integrate that information from different sensory areas together. That integrated sensory information moves to your prefrontal cortex, which helps to do the executive functions, plan your actions and your movements. In both the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex, neurons are arranged according to the part of body that inputs or receives the commands. I thought that was pretty cool. If you have frontal lobe damage, um, this could impair some of those executive responses, but would leave your intellect and your memory intact. Sorry, that was something I'll be able to report on. Previous ideas that a highly convoluted neocortex were needed for advanced cognition aren't necessarily thought to be accurate. Um, birds are able to do some pretty highly um, sophisticated processing um, using nuclei that are in a, a cluster of them. They're located in their pallium, the top or outer portion of the brain. Okay, so that's the avian, avian brain to scale and then the human brain comparing the two to one another. Synaptic connection changes can impact on memory and learning. Two processes determine um, how the nervous system is going to develop um, when you are an embryo. Um, neurons are going to compete for growth supporting factors, and we talked earlier about how only half of the synapses that form are able to survive. Neuroplasticity is showing us how the nervous system, its ability to go through modifications after birth, um, changes can cause signaling to be strengthened or weakened at synapses, um, depending on that activity. Um, memory formation is an example of this. Short-term memory, your immediate perceptions are accessed via the hippocampus. 
The hippocampus is also involved with long-term memory, but that is stored in your cerebral cortex, and it's thought some memory consolidation again takes place while you're sleeping. Long-term potentiation. Um, a form, this is just a form of learning, which is going to cause an increase in your synaptic transmission, transmission strength involves your glutamate receptors in both the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. If they're stimulated at the same time, um, the receptors on these on the postsynaptic membranes change. The human brain as an adult does contain neural stem cells. Um, these stem cells can help to form neurons that then will be matured and incorporated into the adult nervous system. It's felt that these neurons are probably playing a role in the learning process as well as memories. Um, nervous system disorders. Um, we'll talk about several of these. Um, genetic and environmental factors play a role in these. Okay, so they're showing you the genetic component of schizophrenia. 1% um, of the world suffers from this. It's characterized by hallucinations, delusions, um, other symptoms. Um, treatments that are available for this involve focusing on brain pathways that use uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine. Um, two main types of depression, major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. Major depressive, you just um, are not interested in or don't get anything out of doing most activities. Bipolar, you go from manic modes, high mood to depressive loads, low mood. Um, treatments for these um, include um, medications like Prozac. Drug addiction and the brain's reward system. Um, the brain rewards motivation with pleasure. Um, some drugs are addictive because they increase that brain reward system, um, like cocaine, amphetamine, heroin, alcohol, tobacco. Um, when someone is addicted, addicted to drugs or an organism is addicted to drugs, they're characterized by compulsive consumption and an inability to control. Um, addictive drugs can enhance the activity of your dopamine pathway, um, and that can lead to long-lasting changes in the brain's reward system, which cause drug cravings. So on the left, we see the neuron that stimulates um, dopamine. Um, or releases dopamine, um, nicotine helps to stimulate that. Um, when that is generated, that sets off a neuron in the reward pathway and you get the response from it. Um, if you have, have ingested opium or heroin, that inhibits that neuron from continuing to release that neurotransmitter. And if you um, take cocaine or amphetamines, it blocks the neurotransmitter from being broken down in the synaptic cleft. Alzheimer's is a mental deterioration um, characterized by confusion and memory loss. Um, neurofibrillary tangles form amyloid plaques in the brain. Um, there is no cure. There are some medications that can be given to help with some of the symptoms that um, Alzheimer's patients um, encounter. Parkinson's um, is when you're dopamine secreting neurons in the midbrain die off. Um, and when that happens, you start to see muscle tremors, flex posture, shuffling gait. Again, no cure, but there are medications or other approaches that can kind of help with it. 